It is not all that common to have two all-time great coaches, both at the peak of their respective powers, coaching in the same competition at the same time. But from 2016 to 2024, that is exactly what the Premier League got to experience with Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp. These two men and their teams formed arguably the most competitive rivalry we've ever seen at the top of the division. But with Klopp announcing his departure from Liverpool in January 2024, this era of the Premier League is ending. And it's worth spending some time to unpack how these two men came to define it. Klopp and Guardiola are two of the greatest managers of all time, but they're also case studies that support a theory I've had for a long time, which is that there's no one correct path for an elite coach to follow. Guardiola's journey was a little more typical of an elite football manager. Born about an hour from Barcelona, he joined the club at 13 and became a mainstay in a team that won six La Liga titles. He made 47 appearances for the Spanish national team and scored at a World Cup. He was coached by top-level managers and legitimate legends of the game. Basically, everything about his footballing pedigree was elite, so when it came time for him to step into managing one of the biggest clubs in the world in 2008, it probably shouldn't have been that much of a surprise that he fit the role like a hand in a glove. One of my favorite descriptions of Guardiola comes from his longtime assistant, Dominic Torrent, who says that Pep is brave as a coach, but that it's a, quote, controlled bravery. Guardiola has a reputation for being a perfectionist, and he is, but even though the primary feature of his coaching philosophy is controlling the game as much as possible, he also won't hesitate to make big changes if he feels like it's the right time to do so. For instance, in Pep's first season at Barca, in the biggest game of the season against a really good Real Madrid team with the league title potentially on the line, he shifted, mid-game, to playing Lionel Messi as a false nine instead of out on the right. The result was a dominant 6-2 win over their biggest rivals, with Messi scoring twice and Barcelona extending their lead at the top of La Liga, which they would eventually win. Whether it's a big strategic change like putting John Stones in midfield or a bold decision to sell a player, Guardiola's greatest strength as a manager is his meticulousness, but his greatest separator is his willingness to take calculated risks when the situation calls for it. He may be a perfectionist, but he's as confident and creative as he is controlling. And when you package all that together with his background, you've got a guy who's brave enough to take the Barcelona job at 37 and competent enough to immediately win the title. But if Guardiola's bravery is controlled, Klopp's bravery is the exact opposite of that. Born in Stuttgart and raced about an hour away in a town called Glotten, Klopp's playing career was solid, if not quite as spectacular as Guardiola's. He spent almost his entire career with Mainz 05, who these days are mainstays in the Bundesliga, but were a second division team for pretty much the entire time he was there. Because of his versatility and intelligence, though, Klopp played all over the field during his time at Mainz, starting out as a forward or wide midfielder, and slowly working his way back to playing as a fullback or centerback. He may not have played at a World Cup or won a Champions League as a player, but he did retire as Mainz's all-time top goal scorer, and played under visionary coach Wolfgang Frank, a pioneer of the pressing system that Klopp would eventually adopt and use to great effect at both Dortmund and Liverpool. Frank served a similar role in Klopp's development as Johan Cruyff served in Guardiola's, supporting another one of my theories about coaching, which is that if you want to be a great teacher someday, first, you have to be a great student. But once Klopp got his first job, there was no controlling the bravery. Unlike Guardiola, who at least had a season with the Barcelona B team to get his feet wet as a manager, Klopp went directly from playing for a team fighting against relegation to coaching it. Mainz 05 had been trying to replace Klopp's mentor, Wolfgang Frank, since his departure in 2000, including a spell where they went through three managers plus a caretaker in the span of about 10 months. None of them could get the Mainz players, who'd spent years working within Frank's progressive system, to play like a relegation team. So finally, they decided that the solution had to come from within. Klopp retired from playing, took his first job in management, and won six of his first seven games in charge to keep Mainz in Bundesliga Spy. Three years later, Klopp guided Mainz to their first promotion to the Bundesliga in their club's history, and four years after that, coincidentally at the same time that Guardiola was beginning his coaching career at Barcelona, Klopp was named manager at Borussia Dortmund. And that is where things for both men really started to accelerate. When Guardiola took over at Barcelona, he came into a team that had finished third the year before and hadn't won a trophy in two seasons. They were still Barcelona, but even with Messi, Xavi, Thierry Henry, and a swath of other world-class players at their disposal, nobody really expected them to have one of the greatest seasons in modern football history. Which is, of course, exactly what happened. In Guardiola's first season as a top-level manager, Barca won La Liga, in part behind that tactical masterclass we talked about earlier, Copa del Rey, and the Champions League with the win over Sir Alex Ferguson's Manchester United. The Guardiola train had left the station and would not stop until he left the club at the end of 2012. With their former captain as their manager, 
Barcelona won 14 trophies in four seasons, all while playing football that fundamentally changed the way the game has been played in the decades since. But meanwhile, over in Germany, Klopp's Dortmund were also doing things that probably won't be repeated anytime soon. Teams don't usually win the title in Germany so much as they just kind of borrow it from Bayern Munich. The current version of the team may not be doing a great job of reflecting that, but between 1999 and 2010, Bayern won a domestic double, which is both the league title and the league cup, in six separate seasons. That is what Klopp was walking into when he took over at Dortmund, who, through no fault of his, were coming back from the brink of complete economic collapse a few years prior. And yet, within three seasons, Klopp's team were champions, winning their first title in a decade in 2011, and then following that up with another title, plus a German Cup, in 2012. And Klopp did all of this, not with world-renowned superstars, but with young players like Mats Hummels and Robert Lewandowski, who he helped mold into some of the best players in the game. Bayern don't like to be down for long, though, and in 2013, they hired some Spanish guy to try and get themselves back on top, which, of course, they did. But the next two seasons in the Bundesliga would give a little taste of what was going to come later, as both Klopp and Guardiola eventually made their way to England. The first domino to fall was Klopp. After very nearly winning the title in 2013-14, Liverpool sacked Brendan Rodgers a little over a year later, opening the door for Klopp, who'd resigned to Dortmund after finishing seventh. Liverpool's decision actually came down to Klopp and Carlo Ancelotti, the former and future Real Madrid manager, which means that there's an alternate universe out there where Don Carlo became the coach of Liverpool and none of this ever happened. Instead, Klopp was announced just a few days after they fired Rodgers, and Ancelotti went to Bayern Munich to replace Pep Guardiola when he was brought in to be Man City manager in 2016. City had won their first two Premier League titles in the years prior, but they'd been eyeing Guardiola since he was at Barcelona, and after current manager Manuel Pellegrini's contract ran out, they were finally able to get their man. After years of developing into two of the best managers in the world, Klopp and Guardiola were both in England, and the modern Premier League was about to change completely. But I'm actually not all that interested in what happened next. The short version is that they both built teams that were varying degrees of unstoppable and won a whole bunch of stuff. We've done enough of a history lesson already, though, so if you want to see everything these guys have accomplished in England, you can do what I do for all these episodes and just go look it up on Wikipedia. What I'm interested in is why it all happened the way it did. I'm a little bit obsessed with figuring out how and why certain coaching hires work and other ones don't, and especially in cases like this, where not one but two different hires, both of which carried with them a significant degree of risk, work out absolutely spectacularly, it's worth working backwards to try and figure out how it all went down. And to me, the reason that Klopp and Guardiola were both so successful at their respective positions can be summed up in one word. Fit. As I mentioned earlier, the path a manager takes to the top doesn't really matter. You can have had a great playing career or barely played professionally at all. It certainly helps to have worked with a great coach in the past, but backgrounds are flexible, and while it helps to be able to recognize general patterns in them, the specifics aren't really that important. But regardless of the country, the size of the club, or even the sport, fit always matters. You could blow a ton of money on hiring the best coach in the world, and believe me, plenty of teams have tried, but if they're not a good fit for your current situation, you're not going to get anywhere. There are many ways to define something like fit, but in practical terms, I would describe it like this. Hiring for what you want to become, and then giving the manager or coach the tools they need to become that. Let's take Guardiola as an example. City were already winners in England, but they wanted to become a truly elite European side one that could compete for Champions League titles on a yearly basis with your Real Madrids and Bayern Munichs. So from that perspective, it makes a ton of sense to go get the guy who's won pretty much everything and keeps winning everything. But once you've got that person, you've also got to have the infrastructure in place for him or her to be successful. City had that. They hired Chiqui Bierstein, Pep's former sporting director at Barcelona, to the same position in 2012, and also added Ferran Soriano, another former Barcelona executive, as their CEO. Those two had a four-year head start on making City as pep-friendly as possible, so that by the time Guardiola actually took the job, the infrastructure was in place for him to hit the ground running. It still took a while to come together, but by Pep's second season, City were champions and amassing a record 100 points in the league. The City example shows that fit can be created, even if it isn't there naturally. Like, Guardiola probably wouldn't have been a good fit for the pre-UAE takeover City, but he was for this version. But fit can also just be intrinsic or cultural, which is what happened with Klopp and Liverpool. If you go on Liverpool's club website, they list four core values at the heart of their club. Ambition, commitment, dignity, and unity. And if you wanted to sum up Jurgen Klopp's coaching philosophy, with maybe dignity accepted on certain occasions, I think you'd have a hard time finding better words than those. 
not just situationally, but culturally, Klopp and Liverpool were a perfect fit from the very beginning. Like Dortmund, Liverpool are a massive club with a terrific history, but they were also underdogs relative to the clubs running their respective leagues at the time. Both clubs had money to spend in the transfer market, but their business models were also predicated on selling big players when they wanted to keep themselves sustainable. A lot of the big transfers that Liverpool pulled off under Klopp, from Salah to Van Dijk to Sadio Mane, were supported by selling on big players like Raheem Sterling or Philippe Coutinho. And finally, just like he'd done in Dortmund, one of Klopp's greatest successes was turning youth players and native Liverpoolians like Trent Alexander-Arnold and Curtis Jones into bona fide Premier League stars. If you asked someone why Klopp and Guardiola have been so successful in the Premier League, I think they'd probably tell you something about them just being two of the greatest managers of all time, or how much they've changed the game tactically. But I'm firmly of the belief that if you held everything else constant and switched them around so that Guardiola went to Liverpool and Klopp went to City instead, the story of the last eight years or so of Premier League football would have revolved around someone else. These two men are exceptional in their own right, a fact that's proven by their work at previous clubs. But all of this happened because they were the perfect square pegs to go in the square holes that their employers were trying to fill. Lightning struck the Premier League twice in the span of about six months when both Klopp and Guardiola decided they wanted to go work there. And I predict that as this era of the league winds down, teams will hire plenty of elite coaches and recruit plenty of elite players to try and recreate that. The truth is that we won't see a rivalry like this until we get two fits this perfect within such a short amount of time, which is going to require something much harder than just shelling out a bunch of money. Teams need to have an understanding of who they are and where they want to go, which requires a level of introspection and long-term thinking that a lot of them don't feel like they have the time to do. But even if it doesn't end with your team winning the Champions League, it's worth it to get the most out of your club for as long as possible. And look, this may not look like what you think. Fit is extremely context-dependent, meaning that even if a coach has had success everywhere else they've been, hiring them for your club may not make any sense at all. And the opposite may also be true. Even if a coach has not performed well in a previous job, it may or may not have any kind of reflection on their suitability for yours. The fit could have just been wrong, and getting it right could be the difference between a coach being stuck in the mud for their entire career and then becoming a club legend. An idea that literally keeps me up at night sometimes. All of this may sound like an oversimplification to some people, but I really do believe that if you get the fit right, everything else becomes a whole lot easier. It is simple, but it's also true. In a scenario where teams put fit first, we could have a whole league of good fits. We're honestly kind of moving in that direction with all the good coaches getting hired in the Premier League and all over Europe too. The standard of technical and tactical excellence in modern football is incredibly high, but even in that kind of climate, it's possible, if incredibly improbable, for two coaches to get it so right that they rise above everyone else and into their own stratosphere. If the last few years of Premier League football have taught us anything, it's that you don't need a league full of good fits to at least make things interesting. You just need two. Hi everyone, my name is Will, and this is my channel, Student of the Game, where we make videos about sports psychology and culture. And fit, which is an idea that I've been kicking around in my head for a long time, and am very glad to have gotten a chance to talk about on this platform. It doesn't just have to be a sports thing, either. Fit's a good thing to be thinking about in all kinds of work areas, and I genuinely think that if more employers, big or small, took the time to consider the values and goals of the company they want to create, a lot more time and money could be spent more effectively. Anyway, soapbox over. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more content like it. I'll see you guys back here in a couple weeks, but until then, I'm Will, and this is Student of the Game. Bye!